Folks, uh, Jesus will turn your world upside down, and uh, we thank God for that. And that is pretty much the title of the message today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Upside down for Jesus. Upside down for Jesus is the name of the service uh, of the sermon today. Uh, hopefully, you got a hand out there. They're at all three entrances, uh, and you know they they're there so that you could take notes if you choose to do so. Uh, let me give you the outline. Number one: reasoning with the word. Reasoning with the word, and I'll speak about that in just a minute. Number two: rejecting the word. Folks, not everybody uh, cares about the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are people that will reject the word, but that's not our problem and that's not our issue. Our job is to preach and teach the word of God and witness uh, the word of God. Number three, ready for the word. There are people that are waiting for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope you know that we have the answer to every problem in life and that answer is Jesus it is Jesus I think we can all agree that this world we are living in has gotten disturbingly evil in the last 25 years ever since the fall of man in the garden of Eden mankind has been on a downward spiral it seems like more than ever man has gotten extremely hostile towards God and Christians we live in times like no other in history the difficulties and challenges we face are monumental. But every Bible-believing Christian should know that God is in control of all situations of life and that Jesus is the only solution to all of man's problems. Our job as Christians is to keep ourselves unspotted from the world and keep telling everyone we come in contact with about Jesus Christ and salvation. I promise you persecution is going to come. But we must continue to take a stand against evil forces and ungodly behavior. Let's see one strong man, and we're talking about the Apostle Paul, turning his world upside down for Jesus. And I'd like to start in Acts 16, verse 35. Uh, it is the end of this chapter, but it, the, the Scripture itself didn't have enough for just one sermon. If you remember two weeks ago, we talked about the Philippian jailer. Uh, Paul and Silas, and uh, you know, they, they really did. They did the right thing in persecution. They were beaten and thrown in jail for the cause of Christ, yet salvation came to a household because they were following God and following His Word. But let's look at the rest of that story, which leads right into chapter 17. Acts 16, 35, And when it was day, the magistrates sent the officer saying, let, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison, and that was that uh, saved jailer, reported these things, or these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. And looking there, it, it, it looks like, hey, that's neat. You know, the next day they were released. But Paul said to them, and I will say in reading uh, the writers seem to be split on this issue. Some of them thought Paul should have went out quietly, and others said Paul was standing up for his rights as a Roman citizen. Okay, and I'll give you my opinion here in just a minute. Verse 37, but Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison, which meant they were judged without a trial, okay? They did not go through the due process of law. And now, uh, and now uh, they do put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. And I, I just have to chuckle at, at this. He just said, you can go. And Paul said, I'm not leaving the jail. All right? And again, my opinion is that's what Paul, that was Paul's personality. Okay, he wasn't going to go quietly. But the reason I'm leaning towards that is because if as Christians, Paul and Silas did nothing when they were wronged, then the government there could uh, inflict, in, you, know, uh, uh, you know, persecution on the church. Realize that Philippi, a brand new church, was being made there. 
All right, these were young Christians and new Christians. And I believe Paul's motive, I, you know, I don't think I'm even going to ask him about that when we get to heaven. There's more things more important that I'd like to ask Paul than that. All right. But my opinion was he did the right thing because he was looking after those who were coming uh, behind him. Then verse 38, and the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. See, they did not know that they were Romans, okay? They were the ones that were responsible for what happened. And we know it was a riot. It was, uh, it was Jews that were, uh, you know, falsely accusing and being mean-spirited about things. And of course, we know that was exactly what they did with Jesus. Verse 39, then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart the city. Pleaded means, I think somebody apologized. Okay, I think somebody realized, you know what, you know, if the Romans get, get word of this, uh, their, uh, you know, their town and, and their government could be in trouble. So they admitted wrong, I believe, and apologized, but still asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, which again makes me laugh. They said, leave the city. And, and Paul basically said, I'll go when I want to go. All right, I'm going to go to the house of Lydia. That's where the church was meeting in the first place. I am going there. And it tells them why. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. They wanted to spend time in fellowship. They wanted to spend time discipling them even more. They you know, didn't make a scene. They did not have a public worship service, as it says, according to uh, the text that we are reading. But they want to encourage their brothers and sisters in Christ. And then they realized that their time there is finished. So starting in chapter 7, reasoning with the word. And we know here uh, they are leaving Philippi. And it says, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and uh, uh, Paulo Nina, I'm not real good at words. I hope you understand that. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And here, basically, they are going to make a hundred mile trip. And folks, you have to understand that's on feet. You know, they, they weren't riding horses. All right. They were walking where they went. And Paul and Silas and Timothy traveled 30 miles southwest to Amphipolis. And there was not a synagogue there. That's why in this sentence, they just doesn't say anything about them preaching or going to a synagogue in these first two towns. They moved then due west 30 miles uh, to Apollonina and there was no synagogue there either. So they moved 40 miles west to the city of Thessalonica. It was a large city in Macedonia with a large population. And folks, that's what Paul did. He looked for the larger cities to begin a church in. And the population there at the time was over 200,000 people. For in that day, it was very large. And it was a wealthy city. There was much business and commerce located there. It was a port city. Uh, they, the Aegean Sea was there. You could literally see it uh, from the center of town. And it was up you know, kind of in the large hills, I won't say mountains, but it, it formed like an amphitheater there. And there was a large Jewish synagogue. And I'm telling you, when he learned that, Paul's eyes lit up. So, verse 2, then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, this is the synagogue, and for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from Scriptures. And again, he just didn't do it for uh, three weeks. You look at this and you think, well, he was just there, you know, three straight Sabbaths. But, you know, history tells us that he started a ministry there. He started preaching and people were saved. And the word reasoning there, it's different from preaching. Reasoning is more of a teaching. There are preachers and there are teachers. You know, there's, there's different ways to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But his normal way, he went into the synagogues and mostly the Jewish synagogues and, and preached to them. And what they would do is they'd start a question and answer time. 
Okay, A lot of times in teaching they were sitting. They weren't standing as I am preaching today. All right, So there was question and answers there. Reasoning with them. That's why I said on the first point, reasoning with the Word. In verse 3, explaining and demonstrating uh, the, that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. He is the Christ. So after just kind of introduction, after each Sunday adding on things, folks, when we are witnessing, we are preaching and teaching the gospel. We are witnessing the gospel. And that's what we need to do, folks. It's all about Jesus. Everything we do is pointing people to Jesus Christ. And you have to realize there was no New Testament at this time. He's probably teaching from Psalm 22 or probably Isaiah 53. And in a Jewish synagogue, these folks knew the Messiah was coming, but what they did not understand that Jesus had already come. Jesus had already been there. He had already had a ministry. He had three years of a public ministry. He did miracles. People were saved. He preached the gospel about himself. In verse 4, And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. And again, it seems that he went outside the synagogue and he was probably looking for a house like he did. And he was preaching outside of the synagogues. A lot of the times, folks, the people, the Jewish people in the synagogues would not listen to his word. They rejected his word. They did not believe that Jesus had come. So he would go outside and he would preach outside. And, and it seemed like uh, you know many of the Greeks that listened to him listened to the gospel of Jesus Christ and were saved. A revival happened in Thessalonica. And it said, also not a few leading women, which meant also there was a, a core group, probably uh, like Lydia and, and those that met uh, for a prayer group. That, that example had happened. So we see in the reasoning and in the teaching of the word, many people were saved. 1 Corinthians, hold your finger there and go with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. This is Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, uh, uh, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? We know the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrections. We know uh, there were many of the Jews that did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 13, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Folks, the central truth of the gospel is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is everything to us. And the world does not understand that. They do not understand how a man could live. First, they'll say, there is no such thing as a perfect man. There's no such thing. But the virgin birth, he did not have a biological father. Jesus placed the Holy Spirit inside of Mary. He did not have that sin nature. He was pure. He was holy. He was equal with God. And then verse 14, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. If he hasn't arisen, folks, when, it, it was like I was witness to, to a guy one time and I was in the early part of the gospel and I asked, him to, uh, I asked him if he were to die, would he go to heaven? And he says, well, I don't believe in heaven. And I said, well, what do you believe in? He said, I believe when you're dead, you're dead. So you're saying once you die, that is the end of it. And I tried my best to reason with this guy, and he would not listen to a presentation of the gospel. And that's what Paul is saying. If what you believe is true, then your life is empty. Folks, I have to say, I don't understand how people that don't have Christ can live in this world today. Man, I need God. I need Jesus in my life. 
I need hope. I believe in the resurrection of Christ. I believe I do not deserve to go to heaven, but because of the the blood of Jesus Christ, I am saved and I am going to heaven. I am not empty. I have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And your faith is empty. Folks, we don't like empty things. We want to know. The only good empty thing that I know is, is the tomb of Jesus. He's not there. Verse 15, and yes, we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. What is he saying? He brings God into the picture. He's saying God is not truthful. He's saying Jesus was not who they say he is. In and, and verse 16, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your Faith is futile. It means nothing, folks. It's false. It's empty. You are still in your sins. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Oh, listen, folks. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe that we have a home in heaven waiting for us. And it is the people that reject, reject the word of Christ, that they're the ones that are missing something in their lives. So Paul reasoned with these folks. Many of them, you know, accepted the Lord Christ and followed Paul and, and started in that new church. But there were also those who did not believe a word Paul preached or taught. And that comes to the second point, rejecting the Word. Reasoning the Word and rejecting the Word. Look at verse 5. Acts 17, 5. But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious and took, uh, uh, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob and set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring, bring them out to the people. So these Jews that rejected the word, these Jews that did not agree with Paul, got upset. Is that not exactly what happened when Jesus was on this earth? Folks, so they didn't believe him. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. And it got so bad that they crucified the Son of God. Folks, there is going to be opposition out there. Not everyone you talk to wants to hear the truth of the gospel. Not everyone you talk to is going to be nice about it. About it. They will call you judgmental. They will call you all kinds of things. And folks, we have to realize they are not rejecting us. They are rejecting the Word of God. But it's our job to tell them the truth in love, says First Peter. We have to tell the truth. Folks, I am telling you, hell is real. Those without Christ are going there. And it does no, my heart no good when somebody rejects that. I don't, I don't think, well, that's what they deserve. I don't. My heart breaks because they don't understand eternity is forever. But these Jews were just upset. They were mad, and they get a mob. They start something against Paul. And folks, I'm telling you, the Bible tells us all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It could be a family member. It could be someone at work. It could be a boss. It could be somebody on a ball team. They don't like you because you're a Christian. And folks, we can't take that as personal rejection. It's going to happen. And I'm telling you, as this world keeps going like it is, persecution is going to get stronger and persecution is going to get worse. It is going to cost us something to live for Jesus Christ. And I hope we're ready for it, folks. I'm telling you, the end times are coming. We are closer today than we ever have been. So they get them all upset and they attack the house of Jason. Why the house of Jason? Because that's probably where Paul and Silas were. That's probably where they were staying. 
He was staying in that place. All right. And they were thinking, we want, we got to find this guy. All right. He's attracting crowds. He is teaching something that we don't agree with. He is trying to overthrow the government. All right. He is trying to incite riots, even though that was the very thing they did. They were accusing Paul and Jason of doing this. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Oh, folks, I am telling you, you know what our job is as Christians? To turn this world upside down for Jesus. Folks, we can't go with the flow. I am telling you, abortion is wrong. Homosexuality is wrong. What, what the world says is okay is not okay for us. Why? Because our authority is the Word of God. It's God's holy Word. And God's Word is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. These folks were protesting. These folks were rejecting these po folks was accusing these folks of being anti-government, and that's not what was going on. And they were taken, they were dragged out of their house. And folks, I don't know how many years down the road it will be. I'm not trying to predict anything. But I believe, I truly believe, if the Lord tarries, these things could happen right here on earth. Hold your finger there and go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, just go back to the first book in the New Testament. Matthew 5, Jesus has just spoke the Beatitudes, and you can see the Beatitudes in verses 1 through 9. But then he gets down to verse 10, and he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Folks, there, there were... There were people that died for the cause of Christ. There were people that were stoned to death. There were people that were thrown into lion's dens. There were people that would, would be wrapped in cloth and poured oil on them and set on fire because they were Christians. And Jesus said, blessed, happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Folks, we have to understand the minute we die, we will be in the presence of God. The Bible speaks of everyone getting a crown, but I'm telling you the martyrs will get a special crown. We're talking about Stephen who was stoned to death. The Apostle Paul was ex executed later on. And, and look at verse 11. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Folks, I am not backing up. I am not shutting up. I am not watering down. I am telling people the truth of the gospel. There is a day of reckoning. Every one of us, every human being born in life will stand before God. They will give account of their life to God. And I got news for you folks. There, you can throw yourself on the mercy of the court. But I, folks, I'm telling you, at the judgment seat of Christ, it's too late. You've waited too long. Verse 12, listen to this. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Why would we rejoice in persecution? You know why? Because they persecuted Jesus Christ. Because they persecuted the Apostle Paul and the New Testament saints. Because they persecuted the prophets of God. You were just part of a Jesus group, a Jesus band. People all the time want to ask me, hey, are you a Calvinist? Folks, I'm not a Calvinist. I'm a Jesus. I follow Jesus. I follow the Word of God. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I refuse to follow a man. I follow the Son of God and my God up in heaven. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets 
who were before you. And folks, we don't do it. We, we don't share and we don't do all this to be persecuted. But folks, we don't back down from the truth of the Word of God. So these folks were rejecting the Word that was taught and they were persecuting the new Christians in Thessalonica. And it says, verse 7, Jason is harbored then. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying there is another king, Jesus. Well, I got news for you folks. It doesn't matter. I know everything's up in the air about the election. Okay, I have no clue what's going to happen. But I do know this. Jesus is my king. God is in control. God's got this. Quit worrying. It doesn't matter what happens, folks. It changes nothing for me personally. I'll keep going to church. I'll keep reading my Bible. I'll keep praying. I'll keep witnessing for Christ no matter what. And it says, verse 8, and they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things, the very things they started a riot, they were doing. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Folks, they had started that home church in Jason's, uh, yeah, in Jason's house. And they literally drug them out of there. And what they said in those days, it was called, called a peace bond. That they had to put up an amount of money. And as long as there was peace there, they, would, they wouldn't keep the money. But if there was any other thing that happened like that, they would keep the money. And folks, I'm telling you, that's manipulation there. And we, you, folks, you, you just better get ready for it, folks. I'm telling you, it's coming. The next thing, they're going to take away our tax right now, nonprofit tax. And then there's no, I think in the end, they're going to try to tell us as preachers what we can say and what we cannot say. And folks, I am telling you, it ain't going to happen here. I may have to start a jail ministry somewhere and I know David Brooks will come see me if nobody else and Lonnie will give me a Gideon Bible while I'm in there, all right? But I'm going to keep preaching the Word of God regardless who, of who rejects God's holy Word. So we see the reasoning with the Word, the rejection of the Word, and ready for the Word. Look at verse 10. And folks, here's what I love about it. Even when you go through hard times or bad times or persecuted, something good happens. Something good happens. If you will look for something good, the positive things, it will happen. Then the brethren, verse 10, immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Berea was 60 miles west, and Berea was not not a metropolis. It's a much smaller town, and they felt like they would be safe there. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. You know what I found out? Folks, there's always calm waters. I know sometimes we're not in, like today, you may not be in calm waters today, but I'm telling you, they're out there. Sometimes, and God seems that, if you, if you just carefully read God's Word, when someone goes through something very difficult, God gives you those peaceful and calm times in your life. And folks, we ought to thank God for those times of calmness. Those times of peace that we have. And look at the total difference between what happened in Thessalonica and what happened in Berea. Listen to what it says. They were fair-minded, which meant they listened. They reasoned. They didn't automatically reject. They didn't, they didn't you know, just, just criticize everything. They didn't do any of those things. And it says, in that they received the word with all readiness, Every week, every time Paul would preach, they were there. And you know what else? They were there early. They were waiting. They were expecting something to happen. And search the Scriptures daily. Okay? It wasn't that they picked their Bible up on Sunday and, and went to the synagogue. 
All right? Every day, what Paul spoke about, they would get a copy of that scroll and they would get together and they would study that out, seeing if what they were saying was true. And daily to find out whether these things were so. Verse 12, therefore many of them believed. Not some. Many believed. All right? The Spirit was strong. There was a revival in this place. A new church was started in this place. And that's what I'm saying, folks. Hang on. It's going to get better. Hang on. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Don't say, what's the use of this? It's going to get better. Verse 12, therefore many of them believed and, not, uh, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. And notice the difference there, all right? In Thessalonica, uh, uh, we were talking about the synagogues and basically a Greek crowd. The Greeks was the one there. But these ones here uh, were, were Jews and Greeks. And the Word of God fell on them. And God uh, just totally used that for His glory. Now look at verse 13. But when the Jews from Thessalonica heard that the Word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Just back and forth. Back and forth. And folks, the Word of God does divide. There is a divide between those who believe and those who don't believe. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away. And, the, and folks, they were just being smart about it. They had already heard what had happened before and, and, and what had happened to Paul and ha having to uh, you know, go to the next place. So they anticipated that. And they came there also and stirred up the crowds and they sent Paul away to go to the sea. Both Silas and Timothy remained there. See, Paul was the one uh, that was in trouble because he was the one preaching the word and telling the truth of the gospel. So if you look back, they left somebody in Philippi and now they're leaving somebody in Berea. What were they doing? Folks, they were uh, solidifying the churches. They were discipling. They were discipling. Even in a time uh, when there was a rejection of the gospel, they aimed it at Paul. He moved on and the work of God continued continued and it says so those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command uh, for Silas and Timothy to come uh, to him with all speed they departed and folks you can just see the pattern of Paul going through these cities starting new churches leaving somebody there to disciple them and moving on to preach the word and folks we're talking uh, at, you know again in Athens we're talking about a huge metropolis pagans everywhere everywhere next week we will be talking about Thanksgiving and then we will be talking about the city of Athens the week after that well the question is what do we do now what do we do I'm glad you asked first Thessalonians 5 and I close with this 1 Thessalonians 5, go with me. 1 Thessalonians 5, upside down for Jesus. Remember this, we want to be upside down for Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. Folks, there's some words that people say that I will not let go by. When you take my Lord's name in vain, you are going to hear from me, okay? When you go against the gospel of Jesus Christ, I am going to defend the faith. Warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. There are a lot of faint-hearted people this day. Folks, we need to encourage them in the faith. It says, uphold the weak. Be patient with all. Not everybody was raised in church, folks. Not everybody thinks like us. Show patience towards all men. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. Folks, that's, job, that's God's job. Vengeance is the Lord's, not us. But always pursue what is good, both for yourself and for all. Be good and do good. That's what we need to do. Be good and do good. And here it is. Rejoice always. Folks, I believe 
with all my heart, Christians ought to be the happiest peaceful people on the face of the earth. We should rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. That is an attitude of prayer about everything. In everything, give thanks. We're coming into Thanksgiving. And we'll talk about that next week. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You don't have to pray about this. All these things are the will of God. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to rejoice. He wants you to exhort. He wants you to, uh, uh, to warn folks. But be nice while you're doing it. Verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. Folks, the Spirit is working. The Spirit of God is here. The Spirit of God is out there. Do not despise prophecies. Do not reject the Word of God is what it's saying. Believe it. Live it. Breathe it. Read it. Memorize it. 21, test all things. Folks, there's all kinds of spirits out there. There's all kinds. Test those. Hold fast to that which is good. And here's one of my life verses. Abstain from every form of evil. Let me give you a paraphrase for that. When in doubt, do without. If you think it might be the wrong thing to do, don't do it. Don't do it. Verse 23, Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. Sanctification is that process of being set apart from the world. You don't have to go with the flow. You don't have to do what they do. You don't have to be like them. You don't have to be liked by them. Folks, I wasn't put here for people to like me. I was put here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, He's coming. He's coming he who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. Folks, you're not doing it on your own. God is in you. God is with you. God is for you. Brethren, pray for us. I thank God for the prayers of Christians. I thank God for our prayer list. I thank God for prayer warriors. Folks, God is still in the miracle business. God still answers prayers. So what do we do? We just keep doing what God has called us to do. Teach the Word. Witness to the loss. Pray for everyone. Father, thank You for this day. God, thank You that we have an assignment and that assignment is to turn our world upside down for Jesus. God, I pray that we would stand strong. God, I pray that we wouldn't back, in, back up or throw in the towel. God, I pray that we would be bold in our witnesses. God, Paul was bold. And I know not everyone has that characteristics. But God, I pray that people would know that we belong to Jesus. They would know that we love Jesus. That they'd know that we go to church. And they know that Jesus is coming soon. So God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray for the Christian. God, I pray that they would be strong in the faith and they would be looking for uh, divine appointments and opportunities to share Christ. God, I pray that in these times that we would not be afraid of persecution. God, I, I believe with all my heart it's coming. So God, I pray that we would be strong, that we would be, have, have smiles on our face, that we would rejoice and that we would pray without ceasing. Lord, if or someone here that needs to rededicate their life, or even join the church. God, I pray if you speak to them today, they would obey your voice. God, this is your church. This is your time. God, I pray you do with it what you choose. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?